Well, it is Mother's Day. Um, if I don't know you, my name's Clark, and uh, I have the privilege of being married to Miss Pam. And we're um, working from year 27 to year 28 um, right now, and uh, she is definitely the light and the joy of our house, and she has been a great boy mom as God gave us three sons. They're 22, uh, 21, and 17 now. And so um, she's about to add another title uh, to her mother experience, mother-in-law. And so um, we're bringing a girl into the family, uh, Miss Maggie Mosier, um, on exactly, actually exactly two months from today. And so we're super excited about that. And so um, Pam, if you're watching, you're not here yet, I'll see you next service. Um, good morning and happy Mother's Day. So i um, super grateful for Pam in my life. Six years ago today, I wanted to acknowledge this as well as we get started this morning. Did you know we opened six years ago today? Here in Fayetteville? Incredible, yeah. And so I thought we'd do something fun. I know some of you, you just sat down, but if, if you were here that day or you were part of our church when we opened, go ahead and stand up, okay? All right, so, so we love you, but guess why we came to Fayetteville? Because of those of you that are sitting. And now, now look around the room, those that are standing, okay? This is part of what God's using you to do here in Fayetteville. Those of you that are sitting, and this has become your home church, we're so grateful that you're here. Guys, y'all can sit down now. Is that not amazing? When we opened, and I don't know if Michael's in the room or not, but we had some 43 small groups that made up Fellowship Fayetteville. And we were trying to be the church. We didn't gather as the church in a room in Fayetteville. Um, now God's given us over 80 community groups here in Fayetteville. And when you consider our Celebrate Recovery step studies, when you consider our men's groups, small groups, like the one Joe and I are in, when you consider our, uh, our women's groups, our CR step studies, we think that that there's about 140 small groups that make up the fabric and the network of what we call Fellowship Fayetteville. And as you live out the one another's, that's how we're the light of Jesus um, to the world in the greater Fayetteville area. And so um, I'm just grateful, I'm humbled, I'm privileged to be a part of this pastor team as we celebrate uh, six years together. Also wanted to bring your attention uh, to something as you go out the door today, to your right, on your way to the Fayette Kids area, is our Spectra art exhibit, okay? And these artists, these graphic designers, photographers, painters, poets, they do an amazing job crafting art designed to celebrate our teaching series. And so there's some great work um, from our seven weeks in the I Am series. Check those out. God uses their gifts and skills. That's part of how they worship, by the way by using their gifts to bless our church. And so take, take a look at their amazing work out there. Well, if you have, have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter two. And as Elizabeth read, we're gonna be looking at verses one through 11. We're just gonna walk through this story together. It's gonna be the only passage that we look at together uh, today. And so we're going through a little bit of a transition in our 21-week series in John. Um, we just finished up seven weeks as we looked at seven of Jesus's I am statements. We're now gonna look at seven miracles of Jesus. After that, we're gonna look at seven encounters of Jesus. And I thought it'd be a great time to remind you, this is a, if, if you weren't here with us seven weeks ago to pick up one of these, this is a great time to pick one up because it's almost like we're starting a new series, if you will. And so inside the John Journal guide is, um, it's, we've got a direction for you for devotional content. We've got discussion questions for small group. We've got background information for each teaching to kind of set up the story. And, um, and then there's Bible study prompts in there to help you. We, we believe that whatever you get from the scriptures here on Sunday morning is not enough. And so it's important that you study God's word in a small group, that you reflect on God's word um, in your own time with him, and you become a what we call a self-feeder in the context of community. And so to get all you can out of John, uh, this is a guide for you. And so pick one of those up. They're on sale for seven bucks back there. We're just covering our costs um, in the information booth, and so it's not too late to grab one of those. Well, anytime you talk about miracles, 
Uh, this is where we get on the crazy train, John Bain. This for some of you. Uh, this is where Christianity gets a little bit tricky, okay? This is where things don't seem uh, to make sense. You see, in a miracle, the supernatural supersedes time, supersedes space, uh, supersedes the natural or things that we can see and understand and test. And some of us in the room this morning, we've got no file for this. If you're like me, you like to see things with your own eyes before you believe something, even if it's someone you trust. And miracles uh, present us with some challenges here. It's where the circus comes to town for some people. This is where they start, they like the moral teachings of Jesus because it kind of make, uh, it, they, they kind of make society work, right? But this, this miracle thing that you can't explain, it, it gets a bit tricky. Yet in the Old Testament narratives, as we're setting up uh, the, the table for Jesus, uh, consider some of these uh, supernatural miracles. We had uh, around two million people cross the Jordan River at flood stage as God uh, held the water back and made a way for them. There was a day when the sun stood still. There was a day when a donkey spoke. There was a day where a an iron ax floated. There was a day where there were three men in a fiery furnace, and they come out unscathed. There was a young man named Daniel who found himself in a lion's den, and he comes out unharmed. And then our faith, as we move into the New Testament, it culminates in this. Now, this is, this is crazy and incredible, all right? We've got a virgin birth. And a man who walked this planet claiming to be God that never sinned. He makes his way to a cross to pay for your sin and mine. He's raised to life in bodily form. He walks this planet for a few weeks, and then he ascends into heaven with eyewitnesses watching it all go down, all right? Here's Christianity. I give you your faith. It, most of what we believe in what God's done and his trustworthiness and why we trust him and believe in him, and while we come here and celebrate and worship, a lot of this is rooted in miracles. And so we get the privilege of walking through seven of those over the next seven weeks. There's 35 documented miracles in all the Gospels, and we're gonna take a look at seven of those. It's really cool stuff. If they weren't hard to believe, they wouldn't be miraculous. C.S. Lewis says this, a miracle is, by definition, an exception. So let's set up the context for what uh, these miracles are and what they mean. There's four words that are used in Scripture in the original Greek that describe uh, this idea of miracle. The first one is dunamis, and it carries with it the idea of power, okay? It's supernatural power. The focus is on the mighty hand of God to do something. Um, terasa is the second word that's used, and this this word means wonder, and it, it captures the idea of the extraordinary nature of an event. This is where you get that idea of awe, where you just step back and you go, that, I can't explain that, but that's amazing. There's a sense of awe. There's another word, simeon, and it means sign. And this is the word that John primarily uses um, in his gospel account. It just simply means sign, and it's it's. It, it, a sign is just something that, that points to something else. That's why it's a sign. It's pointing you to do something or to go a certain direction. And the signs in John's gospel, by his own words, are pointing us to Jesus. And then there's another word that's used often when we talk of miracles. It's the word ergon, and it simply means works. Um, most often, you'll see this in John, um, that idea of sign and wonder is used in tandem, and so you'll see that a lot here in the book of John. Wayne Grudem uh, sums up, I think he's got a good definition for what a miracle is. It's a less common kind of God's activity in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. The purpose of miracles, simply put, to attest to the identity of Jesus that he is Israel's true Messiah 
and he's the world's savior. It's the purpose of miracles. Um, uh, John's purpose in writing this gospel, and we've said it every week, is to lead people to faith or belief in Jesus. Miracles also illustrate deeper truths. Remember, oh, we looked at who Jesus is when he said, I am the bread of life, and that followed a miracle where he had fed 5,000 people. It wasn't about the bread. It was about pointing people to something deeper, to a relationship with him. And then finally, this is really cool. The, the miracles help us um, see something like a preview of a world to come. We all know this is a broken place, and in Jesus' miracles, he's just like he does today in chapter two. He's coming to the aid of a family. They find himself in a unique spot. He heals the lame and the hurting. Um, it's a broken world, but there's a world coming where things that are broke are fixed, where the old becomes new, where right, uh, um, where everything that's wrong becomes right. And he restores things, and you see that. You see the wholeness come, and we get glimpses of that, of that in the miracles. And so we're gonna work with this statement. I used it a few years ago when we were working through a series in the miracles, this idea, okay? Jesus makes old things new and all things better. Jesus makes old things new and all things better. And we're simply just gonna walk through the passage together and we're gonna see the wedding, the wine, and the wonder. The wedding, the wine, and the wonder. We pick it up here in verse one. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And we find ourselves in Cana. It's a, it's a little village in the hills of Galilee. It's not a huge town, okay? And so this wedding was, that we're about to look at is probably a, quite a big event for a town of this size. Um, some scholars believe that this, this part of John's narrative begins a, uh, basically a three-chapter section, John 2, 3, and 4, that we call the Cana cycle, where Jesus roams uh, from Cana down to Capernaum, um, he makes his way down to Jerusalem, back up through the hills of Galilee, and by the end of chapter four, we're back in Cana for his second sign miracle. And in this Cana cycle, some amazing things are happening. We see him go public in his ministry here. Um, in the next scene, he presents himself as the new temple. And then we see in John chapter three, he presents this idea of the new birth, in his interaction in early chapter four with the Samaritan woman, he gives us a new way to worship, and then we see him healing um, the official son at the end of chapter four, and that's what happens in this thing that we call uh, the, the Cana cycle. Interesting here, his disciples are with him, his mom is with him, and it made me think, you know, I, this is a time of year where a lot of you go to weddings, and I was just, you know, it was probably a multi-day event, okay, at least the reception form of this, and, uh, and so who knows what day they're in in this wedding, but it's probably deep into that event, okay? Just picture a spring day where you call up a couple of buddies and say, hey, are you going to the wedding? You go by and pick them up, and you're gonna pick mom up on the way, okay? There's, there's a real human thing about this experience for Jesus, okay? So they make their way to the wedding, and I think, it's not the point of the passage, but anytime you see Jesus with his men, He's doing discipleship, okay? So for, for those of you that are intentional at making disciples of Jesus, you can't only do it in a coffee shop with your Bible open. It's, it's an integral part of that experience. So you've gotta be with them as you go and interact. Uh, some have said that more is caught than taught, and if you're a parent, you know that, sometimes in a negative way but more is caught than taught. And I think we've got discipleship going on. He's also, I think, finishing well in spite of what it looks like here in his interaction with his mother. He's still taking care of his mom at age 30. There's care going on for her. And so a little bit about what's going on there um, behind the scenes. And as any wedding, and you've been a part of some of those, you want this event, this day, this 22 minutes, this 30 minute wedding, or ours was too long. It's like an hour and five minutes. How, it's a long wedding, right? Yeah. We tried to watch it recently and it, we shut it off. It's like, what were we thinking? 
Let's trim that one back. Well, you want, you want a wedding to go well. And uh, this is a picture from one of the first weddings I did. And uh, these are my two sons, and they were the ring bearers. And Nate's locked in there to your left. Jacob, he's being a little squirrely, all right? And so he's got kind of that, that mischievous look on his face because the groom had just slipped him some money to get down the aisle. And that's, you know, we were hoping, this is the first wedding, you know, this, our kids are involved, it's extra pressure, you know, this has got to go well. And, um, and so he had to bait him in uh, with some money. Um, and then seeing those pictures on Mother's Day, I got to keep going here or I'm going to lose it. Um, some of you know uh, Brian Pope the right reverend, Brian Pope. And I don't really know what to say about this um, on so many levels. There was a day where some of us wore robes at outdoor weddings with apparently no shirt on under them. And I, I don't know, yeah. We can get that slide off of there. I didn't ask him for permission to do that either. Well, it, I've been blessed and honored to be part of some of your weddings, and I'm not gonna dig up all those stories, but I've made some mistakes, and I've been in some situations that were uh, pretty challenging. I, I think I saw Matt and Kara in here, and I didn't ask them permission here for this either, but Kara, I, I remember I, we were doing the vows, and I looked at her, and I said, Will you take Matt to be your wife? <laughs> and she, she corrected me and she said husband. So I'm glad she was locked in and not just repeating what I was saying. Um, I don't know if Stephen and Sarah Billings are in here or not, um, but got to do their wedding over just west of Oklahoma City. And it was in her parents' front yard. And her dad was part of a fireman's crew. And right in the middle of the wedding, this huge fire truck pulls in on the back row, and they just kind of sat there, and they, they kind of watched the event go down. I'd never had that happen before. It was also one of the few weddings. I walked up, and I said, Sarah, hey, where's the wedding coordinator? Who do I need to be working with here? And she goes, you are. <laughs> so we got the line people. Ah, there we are right there. Yeah, we got the line people up, and that's the day I learned how to be a wedding coordinator. It was really cool. That was an amazing, hey, and that's, uh, how many years, is that 15 years this September? Awesome, great job. You guys are making it. Um, I was part of a wedding um, 10 months ago, or no, actually 11 months ago today, June the 8th, in this wedding, it's Parker and Renee West. Are you in here this morning, Parker and Renee? Um, they got married just south of town, and all the, the women in that family, they get married on June the 8th. It doesn't matter what day it is. And so this was a Tuesday afternoon. Ha, how cool is that? Do y'all remember the rain that we had this past week? This was an outdoor wedding on a hill, a beautiful house, and is it, we were overlooking kind of the hills of the Ozarks. And of all the places in Arkansas, this little half-mile area, there was a gully washer, all right? And we had a 45-minute rain delay. And we were standing under the porch trying to stay dry. And uh, it, was, it was the most careful processional I'd ever seen as we were trying to get the grandmas to their seats. And it was about to turn into a slip and slide. And uh, it was a great memory. And so it's, it's a month out, Parker. If you're watching or if you're gonna be in the next service, um, don't forget your anniversary, okay? It's a month from today, Parker. You need to remember that. Um, well, we all want things to go well um, at a wedding, and no doubt that was the heart of Jesus' mom as she comes to him and says, we've got a problem. They have no more wine. And so no doubt they knew this family. She was trying to make this banquet finish well, this wedding event. And, and you see, if, if the wine was to run out, there would be significant shame and embarrassment for the groom's family. And likely it could have cost the head waiter or the master of the banquet um, his job, and she comes to Jesus here, and you can see the interaction here. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come, and his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
uh, most scholars believe that Joseph, his earthly father, has passed away by this point. James, his younger brother, uh, she doesn't go to him, she comes to the older brother, to the responsible one, to Jesus. And no, no doubt she had maybe um, seen some things in his humanity and some unique things about his commitment to the Father and some of his supernatural power. But in this context and in this setting, he had never done a miracle of this magnitude. And so we learned something from the interaction, I think, here. One, especially on Mother's Day, men in our culture, would you ever use this phrase to address your wife or your mom? Don't do that today, please. Woman, give me some lunch. That's not a good idea today, okay? Okay, every phrase has a context. And this is, ironically, it's the same word that's used when he's on the cross in his lowest moment, and he shows care, concern, and compassion for his mom. Woman, your son, John, your mother, and he entrusts um, his mother's care to his disciple, John. So the context determines how this is used. And so we have this interaction. I think part of what's going on here, the little translation is what to you, uh, what to me. Um, what does this have to, why do you concern me with this right now? I think probably what's happening here is we've got a transition of relationship about to go down. And I don't know if that morning Jesus and his father were in prayer and he's wrestling with his father and he knows that today's the day where he goes public with his ministry. It could be that he knew this, this moment was coming. And so she sees this opportunity to help this family and Jesus sees that his hour's about to start ticking. And if he goes public on this day, at this moment, at this event, then it's on. And next destination, in terms of the enormity of an event, will be the cross. And so I think there's something going on here, and she's going through a transition as a mother. She's trying to learn how to become a follower or a disciple of Jesus. And then he's about to redefine what family is. And he, he does that in a variety of passages where he, he expands the family of God to those who spiritually would believe and trust in him. And so I think we've got a transition going on here. He speaks of this, and this is the reason I, I believe this. If you let the text around the text determine what this means, he says this. He says, my hour has not yet come. Uh, that, I think, speaks into uh, kind of the tone of the moment, and he knows that the Passion Week is not too far out, and his death would be in, imminent. Um, you also see this a little bit, if you remember back in Luke chapter two, where his mother and father find him at the temple, and he, sp he speaks to them uniquely. He said, I, I must be about my father's business, or I must be in my father's house, and it says that um, after that moment, it says that he submitted to them. He spoke to them like an adult. He spoke to them with this kind of otherworldly kind of language that had more meaning to it, and yet it says that he submitted to them, and that's what we know he did and how he lived from age 12 to 30 um, up to this scene. And then we see this, and we transition into this scene where the miracle happens, and each author highlights different things, and it says nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. John highlights certain details, and one of those details he highlights here is these six stone pots, and they, they held water that was used for the outward washing of someone's hands before they would go to the temple or to the table um, to eat. And so it's an old covenant practice that John brings up here. And then interesting in this miracle, the only command is to fill the pots, and specifically to the brim, I guess so there could be no trickery. Fill the pots. In this miracle, there's no grand pronouncement. In this 30-minute window, however long, to, however long it took to fill these pots with water, um, there's no one showing any kind of act of faith other than his mother who's just saying, take care of it. 
And it's, it's kind of a miracle in the mundane, behind the scenes. It's public, but it happens very secret. It's unlike the miracle with Lazarus where he, he yells and says, Lazarus, come forth. We don't have wine. Become wine. Water, become wine. There's no pronouncement. It just happens. And then Jesus begins to be a blessing um, to this family. Um, he goes on to say this um, in the verse 9. The master of the banquet uh, tasted the water that had been turned to wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He calls the, bri- the bridegroom aside, and he questions the groom's logic. This late in the party, this late in the celebration, why would you bring this kind of wine out? A mentor friend of mine, a guy that discipled me when I was a college student, he did the math one time, and he came up with these numbers. Maybe you've heard them before. At an average of 25 gallons times six jars, you're talking about 150 gallons of wine. It's the equivalent of 600 bottles of wine or 2,400 servings of wine. It's a lot of wine, all right? And it's good wine. And so I'm not a wine connoisseur, um, but I'm guessing that a $50 bottle of wine is better than an $8 bottle. And this would probably, and there are, I heard someone tell me that they had um, uh, been around someone who had a, uh, I think it was a $35,000 bottle of wine. That seems a little high. Um, but at $50 a bottle, you got about 30000 in today's dollars, $30,000 worth of wine late in a wedding. And Jesus is showing he's, that he's making old things new and all things better, literally, at this wedding as he blesses this family. And he could have done a lot of things to help the poor and to the downtrodden, and he would do that. But here in this moment, he keeps this wedding going. And when we consider the Jewish tradition of those stone pots and old ceremonial um, washing tub, if you will, that washed the outside, now it's turned into a holder of wine that would represent something new, new and better, abundant fulfillment. He breathes life into these old stone pots that could not give life. And to be clear, based on the way this passage is worded, this is not grape juice, all right? Um, there's, people have been drinking too much. And to be clear, Jesus is not promoting or condoning drunkenness in this passage. We're, we're telling a story here that happened. The, the scriptures are clear in Proverbs specifically, but also in the New Testament, that drunkenness is a sin. He's not promoting that behavior. But did you know that Scripture in the Old and the New Testament, when it speaks of wine, it's always with joy, celebration, and fullness. And you would see that honored in a good grape harvest in the Old Testament. It was also used in sorrow, but it's most connected to stories of joy and fullness. So there's wonder going on by this master of the banquet. And then Jesus sums up kind of the wine of these miracles here, John does for him. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee, and you'll see this pattern, was the first of his signs, does a sign, through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed. And Jesus in this moment, as creator, exercised creative power over a fermentation process, chemistry created matter, and he asserted himself over creation at this wedding, um, in this first miracle. Well, what, what, what do we take from this? So I wanna lift our eyes up um, to something bigger, to um, something bigger than just a, a little wedding in Cana. Uh, consider the narrative of scripture when we lift our eyes up from this earthly wedding. Consider the garden moment as we go back to creation in that first wedding. Consider the words that are used in the Old Testament of Yahweh's um, committed faithfulness uh, to Israel. Uh, Consider, um, as we get into the New Testament, Jesus' parable teaching in Matthew 22 when he talks about this wedding feast and he speaks of it as it's, it's this new kingdom of God that's ushering its way in. We consider Paul's language in Ephesians 5 where 
He specifically gives us a picture of Jesus and his bride, the church, and how our marriages today are supposed to manifest that good news um, to a lost world. And then when we get to Revelation 19, towards the end, we've got a picture of a wedding. It's a worship experience, much greater than anything we'll ever experience in this room. There's a worship experience that happens. And it says this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So here in the springtime of 8030, these guests are sipping from cups full of good wine. Jesus knew something else was happening behind the scenes. We know he's thinking about it. He brought it up with his mother, his hour. Consider his words at the Last Supper with his disciples in Luke 22. The cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The wine in that cup would represent the blood that would clean the inside, not ceremonially at the outside. But Jesus knew what was coming. In Matthew 26, as he wrestles with his father in prayer, as he stares the cross down, he says, if it be possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Did you know another image with wine in the scriptures is the wine press? And it's a picture of the wrath of God. You see, it wasn't just this representative cup of wine that represented the blood that would pay for your sin and my sin. There was a cup that he knew he would start drinking on this day. They drank cups of joy. He was drinking a cup of sorrow. So that at a future wedding feast, you could drink real cups of joy. You see, there's a bigger wedding at stake here than this wedding at Cana. And I want to ask you, like John's been asking us these last seven and now eight weeks, do you believe? Do you believe in the one behind the miracle? Do you believe that this morning, through the cup that he drank, you've been invited to a greater wedding? This is your invitation to a wedding that will one day be everything we've ever dreamed of, that no earthly wedding could reveal. Well, Father, as we consider your work on our behalf on the cross, the resurrection, as you paint a picture of a better wedding, as you drink the cup on our behalf so that we could have joy. God, as we reflect in communion and consider those ideas and thoughts, God, I pray that you would give us the courage to believe as his disciples did on this day, that you would um, bolster our belief, embolden us to have the courage to take you at your word and believe that your word is true and this invitation is for us. In Jesus' name.